Hello, this is Joel Alvarez with Law USA coming from Con Expo in Las Vegas 2020. I'm going to take a run through on the active screen technology on the HA61LE. This is the machine that we have here in front of us now. I'm just going to run through real quick and show you the benefits of what this system does. So first off, firing up the machine. There's the initial level of operation for this screen, which is the operator level. This is the only information that they can see once the machine is turned on by the company that's renting the piece of equipment. Basic information up on top, machine model number, the hour meter reading, you got your battery indicator, your temperature for the hydraulic, your oil pressure, and then your engine warning and your engine shutoff flags. Those are all located there, just like the dash of your car. On the left hand side, you got your fuel gauge, monitoring what's in your tank. Next we have what mode of operation you have. You got three modes of operation on the HA61LE. Engine on all the time, automatic mode and battery mode. Battery mode is default on this machine. This is an electric machine with the range extender engine. So you see that it has a uh, defaulted over to the battery system. For the operator to run the engine for whatever purposes, if he wants to just hear the engine or if he's trying to charge up the batteries using the range extender, he would activate the automatic mode. You notice that we switch over to eco mode. What that does is it maintains the battery voltage between a certain percentage. It doesn't let it go down too far, below 70%, but it doesn't fully charge the batteries. That requires a cycle with the charging system. If I want to run the battery, or the engine, excuse me, hit the engine on mode, we're going to glow plug first, and then the engine will fire up. Again, that engine, the only purpose for that engine is to charge the batteries, okay? That does not actually run functionality on the machine. So if the battery system is charged to a capacity, which is what this one is right here, you're looking at 90% capacity, that engine will run, but the generator will not charge. You're just wasting fuel. In this case, not necessary. We're going to keep it on electric mode and just run it on electric mode. Right below that, we're going to have any warning signs that are going to be available here for the technician or the operator. In this case, fuel level low. Any, uh, excuse me, any caution alarms or any alerts that are saying that the machine is having an issue would pop up right here so that the, when the call center, when he returns a caller or sends a caller to the call center or to the company that owns the machine, instead of just calling up saying, hey, I have a flashing light down here at the bottom, I'm actually going to give you a reason for that. The customer should be able to give you a reason for that light. So, for example, I'm going to cause a code. I'm actually removing one of the PWM valves off the handful block, and you'll notice that now we have an alert light here, and we have a failure code on the arm. So now the customer is going to call you up and say, hey, I have this code on this machine. As a technician, your technician can call the customer up and walk him through the information. So in this case, we're going to access the initial level, which is the read-only level. We're using the code 1250. Oops, zero. Enter. Access level 1. Okay, again, this is a read-only. This gives you only a reference of the information, but you can't make any changes at all. You can only read what's going on here, but you can't make any changes. Now you notice that we have a failure light here. Up here we have one active failure. We're going to activate that system and go to the next page, and we're going to see FO404, just like we saw on the first page, and it's going to reference the arm valve. Enter on that one there, and we're going to see now the arm valve, the probable cause for that arm valve, and the instructions to remedy that situation. Instead of just giving you a code and you having to go around and figure out that system, we're going to give you all that information up front for you to see. So we're going to enter next to the next page. Excuse me, one back. Notice that we have that chevron there. That tells us that there's more information on the next page. You hit the check mark to go to the next page. You hit the little X button on the bottom to go back one page, like so. No, we're already back on this page. You hit this one here to go back a whole um, uh, mode or a menu item. And then if you hit the home button up top, you're going to take you back to the home screen. Up and down arrows, left and right arrows, just give you reference on being able to move the cursor up or down or left or right. So again, we're going to go into failures, current failures. Notice that there's current failures and failure log. I'll reference the failure log here in a bit. Current failures, arm valve. More information on the next page for the arm valve, FO404. And it's on the next page. YV420U, arm raise valve. Real time, we're gonna give you the real time value going to that component. So if I were to activate arm raise, notice that there's no power coming out to it, okay? So there's something going on that is not consuming that power. We're not getting that signal. So it says here, if arm raise function is requested, output must be on. So if I request this, it must be on. If not, we're going to go through the steps here to check why this feature is not working. So we're going to go through and check power supply fuse. Fuse 13, 20 amp fuse. Check the power supply voltage on uh, battery voltage on wire 103. And then you check output wire continuity. So we're not just telling you what's wrong. We're going to tell you where to go look so you can actually remedy the problem. Next step is we're going to give you the inputs and outputs so you don't have to go get the book and find out where the stuff's located or what it's doing or how it's reading the signal. We're going to give you that information all on the screen. Type of signal is a PWM, pulse width modulation signal. Okay. 
and there were certain studies open circuit. Any technician, you talk to them about open circuit, short circuit, or closed circuit, they're gonna tell you that that right there, open circuit means there's a break in the harness. There's a break in the connection between the control system and that end component, okay? Or it's a disconnected component. Now you know what you're looking for. Next step is what computer controls it? SPU 7066. To our left of our control box here, we have that silver box, and we're gonna be able to reference that it's coming from that. That's the computer that controls it, and that's where the signal's coming from. Now, next part, right below it's connector, or so it's pin and wire. Connector 1B, pin number 10 on that connector, and 201 is the wire number. So if you were to go over to that computer system, there's connector 1, 2, and 3, A and B on each one. Connector 1, B, you pull back on the sheathing, you'll see the pin numbers. It's gonna be pin number 10 on the actual connector, and the wire number would be 201. Right? If we look down and scroll down, because there's more information on just below that, we're gonna give a reference as to where it's located, as well as a picture identifying the component, so you can identify it on the machine. On the component itself, the wire harness coming to it is referenced YV420U and it will be easy enough for you to see where it originates from, where it goes to without having to go find the manuals for that machine or find uh, having to make a phone call and say, hey, I need to find this location of this component. There's multiple locations located or multiple components that are just uh, variably, uh, variable locations on different machines. So it's good to have this system to be able to identify quickly what your problem is and where you need to be. Once you fix that component, I just fixed the connection here. Go back one page, one page. Notice that now it's not red, now it's just gray. Now at the bottom we give you active failures in red and detected failure, non-active, in gray. That means that within the last power cycle, we had that issue. So I can either turn off the machine or I can delete the failure. In this case, I'm going to turn off the machine. Turn the machine back on. Computer system comes back on again and it requires me to put in that access level one code. Enter access level one, and you notice that my failure light is no longer on, my failures are no longer on here. Current failures, nothing detected, okay? For example, your technician just drove all the way to the job site, customer had the machine sitting there. When he gets to the machine, the machine's no longer having a problem, okay? How many times does that happen? A lot. I've been there, done that a few times. So at that point, the technician's next step is, well, if, I can, if it's not broken, I can't fix it, so I'm gonna take off to the next customer, call me if you have a problem. In this case here, the technician, instead of making that customer wait for that issue to come back again and not be able to actually troubleshoot anything uh, he can go through the failure log of that machine see what the problem was date and time of when that customer experienced that problem he can go through and then enter that information and we're going to give all the troubleshooting information for that issue down to the picture component identification notice that that zero percent or zero milliamps when i was activating it earlier now i can activate it and see that we're receiving a signal to it okay that helps a lot in being able to troubleshoot when you have minimal tools or when it's raining out and you don't want to get your multimeter or your laptop out connected to the machine. The schematics are all built in, not, excuse me, not the schematics, but the uh, component identification, location, uh, and a roadmap of what you need to do is here without having to bring out paper on a windy day like we have here today. Excuse the wind if there's uh, a lot of wind coming on the camera. So it's a very useful system for technicians. Okay, go back one more page. Next up, down at the bottom, we can go to access modes. There's three different levels of access to this machine. Obviously, the operator is just a hands-on uh, operating machine without being able to see information. Level one is what you see here, which is read-only. If I wanted to go into machine settings, speeds and ramps, drive forward, and adjust that speed, it will not allow me to do that without a level two code. Level two makes parameter changes to the machine. That's where you can make adjustments to the machine, make it run a little faster, make it run a little slower. Just fine tune it for the customer. Well, level two does not allow you to make the machine unsafe. It does not allow you to make any safety changes on the machine. That's required with a level three code. Level three code, in order to get that, you have to call one of our technicians here at Halal USA, or you have to go through our training classes so that we can give you access to be able to receive that yourself and be able to access that information yourself. But all the functions on this machine are adjustable from this screen. All boom functions and drive functions. Okay. Back one more. Calibrations. Calibrations are also done with this machine. Offset load management. If you want to do uh, load management, the steering angle, the tilt sensor, uh, all that information can be adjusted, calibrated with this here. The only reason why you need a diagnostic tool for your laptop or a laptop now is so you can do software updates. Our service dealers or our level three trained customers are the ones that we authorize to do that information, uh, software updates. Anyone else, you have to go through and uh, communicate with them accordingly. We'd be happy to train all you, everybody 
to bring them up to the level three access, but again, you have to come to our locations in Long Beach, California, and Virginia Beach, Virginia, in order to proceed through the training of that. Machine configurations, the next item on the menu is where you make your adjustments for your uh, options. This is where you adjust your buzzer. Right now we have it off because we're at the show. We wanted to keep it off and keep it uh, noise uh, a little down with the people around us. But if I wanted to turn it on, I would just activate that and select which one I wanted to activate. Active lighting system, container mode, those are for container modes for shipping, the battery charging. This machine has dual charging plus the onboard charging with the generator. So the generator obviously charges the batteries up to a certain level, but the battery system actually has a charger. The charger has two different modes, excuse me, three to four modes. 240 outlet mode with a 16 amp circuit, if you have a 16 amp circuit, or a 240 mode with a 10 amp circuit. That's gonna allow you to charge the machines that much faster depending on what your job site power configurations are. 110 with 16 amp and 110 with 10 amp. 110 16 is pretty much standard, um, but if your facility does not have that, we want to select down to 10 amp so that we don't damage internal componentry. Up on that. Country selection and ECU, those are set up when the machine is new, when you start up the machine or when you replace major componentry like the computer system. In this case, not necessary for us to uh, worry about, but just understand that we have the capability of offering this machine pretty much worldwide. Got some more diagnostics. Technicians are going to operate in this state, uh, in this uh, menu, quite a bit. It's going to be the machine state, current status of the machine. So, if I wanted to check the weight of the platform, we can see the weight of the platform. Um, come back to engine codes and engine issues. We can go through the engine and see all the pertinent information down to the trouble codes that the engine Kubota offers us. This machine has a Kubota diesel engine in it. So uh, they only give us a limited amount of information. We provide that over to you. Any more information than that, you'd have to go through Kubota directly. And then current state of every other features, other other uh, statuses of the machine. Next up, we have the functions. This right here is where you do a function test on the machine. This is where you do a drivability test. And that can be take your car to the dealership and they plug in their computers and then they drive it around the block and they check all the servos and the transmission solo lines and make sure that everything's working properly. We do the same thing here for all the functions of the machine. So in this case, if I wanted to drive micro speed and do a test from the platform micro speed, I would activate that. Now it's telling me that I cannot continue forward because I'm selected to the turret and so I'm not in the right um, parameters in order to activate that test. So I'm going to back up one more, one more, and we're going to go down to, for example, the arm. Hit the arm, arm raise. If I activate arm raise from turret, notice that there's a turret and there's a platform. Turret arm raise, I'm gonna activate that. I'm gonna start that test, and then I'm going to go here and activate that. Excuse me a second. Set point not detected, I took too long to do it, so notice here that it's gonna tell us that my enable switch was not activated and my arm raise was not activated. However, if I activate the switch now, notice that they'll go green, telling me that that is actually working. But I took too long to activate that because I had to look and make sure that nobody was in the way. Okay? So this goes through and checks all the components, electrical components that are tied to that system so that you're able to perform a test on that electrical system and, and um, determine if, if your problem is electrical or if it's hydraulic. If it's electrical, it's gonna come up on the screen. If it's hydraulic, obviously everything over here would be green and you would have no issues on that. So I'm gonna actually do the test correctly this time. Start, go up. Again, I took too long, give me a second. Let me back up one more and bring it down a little bit. like the one is not cooperating so I'm just gonna leave it be for now. But that's where you come in and do the drivability or excuse me, not just do it right now. Let's see right here. So see if we can do it quickly enough. Okay, notice that we have all this information here. Computer system receiving the set point from the joystick or the controls in this case here, and then the control coming out to the valve for through the computer system. Okay. Next we have the slowdown or the speed settings, and then all the electrical components that are tied to that system, so that you can determine if all any of those machines or any of those components have issues. 
Okay. Again, you have that for every function, every direction from ground controls or upper controls, wherever the controls are activated. Obviously, drive system and steering system is not available from the ground controls, only from the platform controls. And inputs and outputs. This is the next menu that's going to be very helpful, is identifying the values of every component that you have electronically connected to this computer system. Digital inputs are on and off signals being sent in from the from uh, inputs, from the joysticks or from the uh, toggle switches, and then the uh, digital outputs are the on and off signals being sent out from the computer system. Okay, and then analog inputs are varying signals in. That's a joystick. That's a uh, being a, a stroke forward or stroke reverse. Um, there's a varying voltage coming into that, so that's going to be a varying input. And then your analog outputs. That's going to be the varying output that comes out to your drive system to speed it up or to slow it down. So, for example, if I wanted to find my uh, drive joystick, for example, I would go to analog inputs, and then I would scroll down until I find my drive access joystick. There it is. And then I can go through the troubleshooting parameters for that know where it's located and a picture identifying that component very handy piece of information here for your technicians to be able to identify what the location is of those components and be able to determine their uh, if they're working properly or not back up one more and we're going to finish off with maintenance under maintenance in this menu we have maintenance to be done up top maintenance to be done is telling us what interval we need to do and how far along we are uh, to get that system done. So right now the engine has been running for 6.4 hours and we have a scheduled first level of maintenance at 244 hours. Second level of maintenance at 499 hours and then scheduled maintenance on the second level of operation, hydraulic oil change. So this first one was, uh, the first one is level of operation check to make sure the machine is still working properly. Second one right here, excuse me, was the uh, engine oil filter change, air filter and fuel filters at 500 hours. That is set by the manufacturer of the engine, not by Hula. So we can't make that change, okay? And then at the bottom, we have the scheduled maintenance level operation hydraulic oil change. In this case, 994 hours is going to be required to change that oil. Back up one more, and we have the maintenance log. In the maintenance log, we have what's been done and when it was done. I cleared this yesterday just as a test. Um, also, the machine's at low hours, so we're just going to make sure that we get this machine serviced regularly enough to uh, avoid this from being an issue. But you can have a, a calendar date and also a time of the hours of when that service was done. Another very important section for this machine is the events log. This is for management, operational uh, management, uh, and to understand the service management, excuse me, the operations management, the service management, and to understand the usability that your customers are, uh, how they're using this machine, if they're abusing this machine, or if they actually know how to properly manipulate or handle this machine. So in this case, under events log, anything safety related, at least that's happened on the activity of the machine, will be logged here for your reference. So in this case, if I activate or enter the events log, I can select by date to see anything that's happened to this machine that can potentially put it in an unsafe situation. So reach limit of the machine. They've operated the machine at the limit that the maximum limit of it. We're just logging that information so that you're aware that your customers are, uh, how they're being used, how the machine's being utilized. Also, full reload of the battery. You'll notice that we have it here. Um, that's to make sure that you're monitoring that your customers are properly charging this machine. The range of cylinder engine on this machine does not fully charge the battery system. It gets it up to a certain capacity. You still have to plug it in and let it equalize and final charge with the onboard charger. So that's going to give you a reference if your customers are doing that or not. Scrolling down a little bit more, give you a little more information, active shield bar activation. In this case here, that is the uh, anti-crushing system that we have located at the upper control box of the platform. If you see that a lot of those being activated, maybe your customer doesn't know how to operate the machine properly, or they're putting themselves in a dangerous situation where they consistently require more training to avoid that further, uh, just putting themselves in further danger. Scroll down a little bit more, parameter changes. Anytime something's been changed or mod uh, modified on the machine, a uh, parameter change, speeding up or slowing down, we're going to log that information here on the computer system as well. Machine in slope. If the machine is operating on a tilt, okay? If the machine was put in a tilt, put in a tilt situation and then tipped over, for example, for insurance or uh, um, investigative purposes, we can see if that machine was actually in the slope, what date and time it happened, and if the customer was given or the operator was given an alert saying that he was putting the machine in a dangerous situation. So there's a lot of information allowing the customer or the owner, excuse me, our customer, to protect themselves from liability down the road. Lastly, we're going to come down to usage log. Under the usage log, we give you a day and a time of day, or excuse me, a day, yeah, a time of day, and then how much time has actually been operated on that machine. So in this case, we're giving you um, 
machine, let's say for example, you rent the machine out on Friday, they call you back up on Monday saying, I want you to pick up the machine, it wasn't used, I didn't work with it because the machine was just failed and it didn't work all weekend long, but you can come back and reference if that was true by saying what date is, time of day, and how much time the machine was actually operated. If you see these conditions where it's 6 minutes, 12 minutes, 13 minutes, 3 minutes, yeah, probably they're telling the truth and there's an issue with the machine you need to address. But if we scroll down and we find 30 minutes or an hour, 6 hours or whatever you would find, then, oops, I went too far. Then you would know that the customer is telling you one thing, but the machine is telling you another, that it actually has been operated. And that's operational time, not just key switch on time. Okay. Lastly, depending on what uh, time frame you like to cycle your piece of equipment, it's either five years or seven years based on other companies that I've worked with in the past, um, you'd like to know and say, hey, you know what, maybe I want to keep this machine depending on how much use and abuse has been seeing over the years. In this case, we'll come in, I would enter access level two, excuse me a second. Unlock access level two. And then I can see the functionality of the machine. In this case, how many, how much time each function has actually ran through. How much time in hours the boom raise movement, boom descent movement, boom telescope, arm raise, arm descent, turntable orientation. That way, whenever five years or seven years comes around when you're figuring out if I'm gonna keep this machine or not, maybe it has, you know, we're gonna scroll down to the engine. Engine running 3.9 hours in this case right here. Maybe you have 1,300 hours, but your operational time you only have 300 hours. That tells you that the customers operating the machine are running the engine and letting that idle, but you're not actually functioning all the other components. So you can do a service of maintenance on the engine and not necessarily have to worry about everything else on the machine because that's still in good, decent working order. A couple other things that we have here that we would like to share is load. How much load, how much time the machine has had under 100 kilograms, between 100 and 170 kilograms, 170 and 230 kilograms, 230 and 350 kilograms, and then any weight on this machine that's been over 350 kilograms, telling you we're going to give you a reference as to how much time this machine has actually been in a improper usage situation. Low battery level on the battery, excuse me, no water level on the batteries. We want to make sure that the batteries are properly maintained. If we have a battery management system that monitors that information and it stores it on this computer system to make sure that the customer or the operator or the owner of the machine is actually going through and maintaining the batteries like they should. Okay. How much time has been used in auto electrical mode, auto mode, and the engine running mode? And then the state of batteries. So in this case, we have zero to five percent state of batteries. How much time the machine has stayed there? In this case, 0.1 hours during the testing period, five to 20 percent, and then 20 to 80 percent. That's going to be the most time that you're going to have in there. It's going to be the 20 to 80 percent range because the machine's operating and it's being utilized. Okay, and then 80 to 100 percent on that machine. Poor storage conditions would be machine stored discharged and in a cold weather condition and such that's causing the machine to deplete the power uh, on the batteries a lot faster so for storage conditions you want to make sure that you store the batteries fully charged that you don't store them in a freezing condition or a freezer uh, overnight because we are going to monitor and record that information as well uh, and then use beyond advisable limits the machine has been abused the machine's telling you there's an issue let's stop working in this condition and you continue to try to manipulate that machine further we're going to record that information as well and then down at the bottom is maximum load value. In this case, 453 kilograms. Your drivers are gonna be the biggest culprit of this right here because they chain down and ratchet down those platforms if causing an excess of, of weight being recorded into the computer system. So just make sure you guys are paying attention to that and you're, you're operating and um, properly transporting this piece of equipment. So that's all the information that we have available on this computer system. If you have any other questions, please give me a call and we'll be happy to show it to you further. Thank you. Thank you.